My name is Hannes Park. I'm a professor at the University of Georgia, professor of international affairs, and I'm also uh, the director of the Center for the Study of Global Issues at that university. And I've uh, written uh, books on North Korea, most recent one being uh, North Korea, the Politics of Unconventional Wisdom, uh, based on my numerous trips to that country in uh, recent years. Currently in the media, we're seeing coverage a lot of North Korea and tied into the possibility that North Korea has nuclear weapons, yet the coverage seems to be totally void of any context of the history of Korea. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of, uh, of what is missing from all of this. Uh, right. The, in the uh, context of uh, the controversy surrounding North Korea's nuclear program, uh, we have to have some knowledge about the history. Where does this come from? Uh, many people are puzzled by the fact that a country as poor, as desperate, as isolated internationally, and still has uh, such military preparedness. I believe North Korea has nuclear bombs and has a full uh, ability to produce without importing any parts or relying on foreign technology. Uh, so you have to, in history, you have to think about Japanese occupation period, which ran from 1910 to 1945. Uh, Kim Il-sung was allegedly, I think there's some truth to that as well, uh, was a national leader. And uh, he was a guerrilla uh, warfare leader in, uh, in China, Manchuria, uh, during that period when he was uh, quite young. Uh, I read his autobiography. Repeatedly, he uh, shows his amazement at the might of nuclear bomb that made Japan, the Japanese Empire, surrender uh, instantly. So he developed intense desire to develop that very weapon so that no one can uh, interfere with, uh, with North Korea. So that intense desire was carried on to his policy when he assumed the power in 1948. Uh, for, you know, he died in 1974, so it's a, it's a long time spent. Uh, consistently and persistently, he pursued a nuclear program uh, with the Chinese help, with the Soviets' help. So they did develop the indigenous capability, uh, so it's very difficult to curtail North Korean nuclear program with the external pressure. Yeah, that, 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 with that background, then uh, we have to uh, assess uh, how can we control North Korean nuclear program. Uh, since it's indigenous, uh, it's very difficult to uh, control it by way of blocking, uh, you know, technology or material uh, being imported to North Korea. So it's, it's going to be very difficult and very difficult to monitor the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the operation or activities uh, on a nuclear program. Uh, so with this, then, uh, we must realize that uh, how come a country such a poor and uh, isolated uh, is capable of developing these weapons and as well as military preparedness. And I think uh, you have to put yourself in North Korean shoes. Uh, they are really up against the wall. Uh, we're talking about an ordinary, North Korea is ordinary system in, in many respects. A system that is against the wall and uh, that has lost all allies, the Soviet Union, disappeared. China changed. Eastern European allies all gone. And whereas in South Korea, the security alliance, the United States, Japan, and South Korean alliance intact, even strengthened with the ever sophisticated weapons presence in South Korea, coupled with uh, periodic uh, joint military exercises. So they have uh, developed intense uh, fear uh, 
and uh, they had developed uh, a sort of mentality or mindset that might be called uh, siege mentality. Uh, so they are very fearful of their uh, existence. Uh, the, the, they think they are threatened and they can be attacked any time. In fact, if you look objectively, their fear, fear is very justified, uh, psychologically as well as uh, you know, physically. And that is uh, the American administration uh, under George W. Bush presidency now defined North Korea as one of the axis of evil countries. And uh, uh, certainly right now Iraq is gone, North Korea destroyed, I mean the United States destroyed, destroyed Iraq, and Iran and North Korea may be uh, next uh, uh, targets. So North Korea is very mindful of that. I personally visited North Korea perhaps uh, about 35, 37 times uh, during the mostly period of the 90s. Uh, last time I visited was uh, less than two months ago. Uh, it was uh, during the, uh, uh, the Iraqi operation and toward the end of the Iraqi operation. Uh, so North Korea saw the demise of uh, Iraq as a result of American military deployment. Uh, North Korea uh, was uh, was a, uh, uh, had had a reason to be uh, fearful of uh, of the United States military uh, policy. Uh, so, uh, given that, uh, in order to survive, you know, in the part of the regime, uh, they're not going to give up a weapons program. You know, uh, so the weapons program. The question how to curtail North Korea's reference program. Uh, you have to put yourself in North Korean shoes. What might be uh, enough uh, incentive uh, for North Koreans to consider uh, reducing or even doing away with the military, uh, the weapons program? Uh, it's going to be very difficult uh, unless, unless you, you are uh, you, you, you assume that uh, North Korean leadership will do it uh, despite the possibility of being uh, collapsed, uh, then they might do it. But that assumption is a very, very uh, shaky assumption. No regime would undercut its own uh, existence. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very difficult I mean, you, uh, how you resolve it. Uh, you either uh, I guess the Bush administration is contemplating on uh, applying military pressure. At this time, economic and other diplomatic uh, pressures. I personally think that economic sanction, blockade, uh, all these uh, uh, sanctions uh, short of uh, the military uh, are not going to work because they have been uh, sanctioned to the bone for the last uh, you know, five, ten years. Uh, so resulting in part because of that mass starvation and mass death. Uh, if a country will collapse because of economic difficulties, North Korea would have collapsed many times over. A country doesn't collapse because of economic difficulty. It does con collapse if it has legitimacy crisis for the regime. But North Korea doesn't. The leadership enjoys full legitimacy from the people. Uh, so economic pressure, in fact, we don't have a whole lot of pressure uh, instruments. That is, with what can we pressure anymore? They're not trading with other governments. They're not importing any spare parts. What can we do, you know? And we're talking about uh, blocking their uh, drug uh, imports or dealings and counterfeit and uh, missiles export and all that, uh, that's uh, much more symbolic. We don't know the volume of it, and I think the volume is very minimal in terms of the amount of money generated from that, and, and, uh, and that sanction uh, is not going to 
be influential. It's not going to uh, press North Korea enough. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the Bush administration is contemplating on uh, attacking uh, using surgical uh, uh, military strikes. That is never going to work because North Korea is no Iraq. It has a very formidable military preparedness. And North Korea's uh, military uh, buildup uh, was made or has been made at the expense of enormous amount of sacrifices in the area of economic development, the human sufferings, and so on. In other words, their weapons are much more precious or at least regarded precious than we think weapons in other countries. So they are not going to see, in my opinion, sit down and just witness uh, the dismantling of their weapons by surgical strike, strikes from the United States. Uh, they, would, they will have every incentive and motivation to use those weapons before too late. Uh, even after a few uh, surgical strikes, they will have enough uh, retaliatory capability. So, you know, uh, given the proximity of Seoul, South Korean capital, with 1.2 billion people, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, 12 million people uh, living in South Korea, that's uh, within 35 uh, miles range. Uh, in any kind of uh, all-out uh, war or confrontation would mean millions, literally four or five million people, South Koreans uh, killed. And of course, uh, of 37 some American troops, uh, I don't think the casualties will be limited to uh, thousands, I mean hundreds, it will be thousands of people. So the Bush administration uh, should be thinking about these ramifications uh, implications of such an option, military strike. So uh, that leaves only one option. You have to uh, resolve this issue peacefully. Or else the United States and other parties should be uh, prepared to accept nuclear North Korea. So either uh, allow or accept nuclear North Korea or uh, peaceful resolution. Now what would be the steps towards peaceful resolution? I think uh, uh, North Korea, what North Korea wants uh, is very clear. People are saying that they cannot understand North Korean behavior and I do understand North Korean behavior. It's, it's not very hard to understand. Uh, they, want, uh, they want security assurance and very specifically they want to conclude the Korean War and uh, with all reverence for uh, critics out there and I agree with North Korea uh, there's no reason to prolong uh, this armistice agreement or truce uh, temporary ceasefire situation uh, beyond 50 years there's absolutely no reason. There's no Cold War anymore. There's no military confrontation anymore here in this part of, of the world. Uh, so the, because of the, uh, the presence of the Korean War still lingering on, you have a military buildup in both sides, either side of the DMZ. And I think it's totally a waste of resources and unnecessary. So uh, we have to terminate that. That termination process involves only the United States and North Korea because they're the ones who signed on the armistice agreement. And that's what North Korea wants initially. And then uh, they want uh, more uh, regional uh, security uh, regime or peace regime. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a proper thing to do. Uh, however, the United States uh, wants North Korea to give up weapons of mass destruction unconditionally. Uh, I think that demand from the uh, non-proliferation treaty, from the IAEA point of view, is uh, justified. However, North Korea and the United States relationship is 
not a normal relationship, the adversarial, the enemy relationship. Now, actually, uh, we're looking beyond looking at North Korea from American point of view, beyond the border, the enemy, and telling them, you give up your weapons program. While we have all kinds of arsenals of weapons, they're not going to be persuaded by that. And if they say, yes, we will give up, I mean, they may say, for political economic reasons in international politics and so forth, but to believe that they are telling the truth is utterly naive. So you've got to uh, alleviate this uh, uh, armistice agreement situation, replace it uh, with some sort of peace arrangement first. Uh, because of the, you know, the fact is America is a powerful country. And uh, we have uh, some underlying premise difference. Americans are not saying uh, exactly this, but they, their mindset is that, hey, we're different, we're stronger, we're the richest country in the world. We're on the same footing. We're not on the same footing. The North Koreans, you have to tell what we, we, we want you to. Then you'll have all these lollipops and all these economic aid and so forth. If you're going to survive, you better be nice to us. And that's the American mentality. And North Koreans uh, are not very uncomf uh, 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 uncomfortable with that. Uh, they like to see, you know, yeah, we may be poor and all that, but we are a sovereign state. Uh, uh, so, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, defending the country and insisting on national sovereignty, we're equal. So you have a, that underlying premise difference. Americans are not going to give North Korea uh, you know, uh, what they want, uh, that is uh, uh, dismantlement, dismantling the weapons program, uh, but uh, insist on giving up the weapons program first. But uh, uh, I guess eventually I think both sides uh, should uh, compromise, especially the United States. So I think eventually what is likely to happen is a multi multilateral situation to s give uh, face saving to the United States. Uh, within multilateral situation, there will be enough opportunities uh, for North Korea and the United States to sit down, have caucus meetings, so substantively and actually de facto to uh, uh, a bilateral meeting uh, can be incorporated. Uh, that is uh, to, uh, to, uh, to satisfy, say, uh, North Korean uh, side. So in that way, uh, we have to find uh, some uh, workable solution. Uh, outside that, you know, there's no way that we can allow military confrontation. No way we can uh, induce North Korean collapse. You know, collapsed North Korea will be a nightmare uh, in the region. The, uh, the Chinese, it's not really, it's a nightmare. Uh, you know, millions, literally millions of people will come out into China. And uh, that's uh, not only economic burden, but more importantly, uh, it's a diplomatic uh, nightmare. And the South Korean economy and society are not going to be prepared for the absorption of North Koreans. Uh, you know, the German unification, as you see, uh, seemingly successful, but uh, st still, you know, for uh, more than a decade, they are experiencing some maladjustment. Uh, still, we are witnessing that. Uh, but if you compare German uh, unification situation with the possible inter-Korea situation here, uh, very clearly West Germany was relatively far more stable and uh, economically secure and in fact physically larger than East Germany was in comparison with the comparison of uh, South Korea and North Korea. So South Korea cannot uh, bear the burden of absorbing North Korea economically, socially, 
political instability, unrest wise. Uh, so collapsing, collapsed North Korea is, uh, is, is no interest for, for any, any, any party around uh, uh, this area. I think a lot of people um, would be surprised to find uh, in the armistice between North Korea and the United States that South Korea wasn't involved in that. Um, can you give us a sense of, of why South Korea isn't involved with that and then tell us about how the concept of reconciliation is important to uh, finding a solution to, to all of this? Right. Uh, when the Korean War was waged, it was between North Korea and the United Nations. Uh, United Nations headed by the United States. And South Korea was not the principal party adversarial to North Korea. Uh, legally, uh, especially legally, and also in terms of military command uh, power. It was the United Nations and the United States on behalf of the United Nations. And uh, that was the history. Unfortunately, uh, that is the legal uh, legal side of it, a de facto situation, certainly South Korea cannot be uh, left out in any kind of uh, peace building uh, process. So what I'm suggesting is the legal inadequacies or legal matters should be taken uh, care of first uh, legally and uh, you know changing the armistice agreement into a, some sort of peace arrangement is not big deal is a signing on a new piece of paper. The situation will not change. In to change the situation, we must involve South Korea very significantly. Uh, so we have to think about in this uh, dual stage or two stage terms. Uh, I think uh, the United States, in South Korea, unlike previous governments, this Romuhan uh, government is prepared to accept that. You know, you guys you do and deal with the legal problem of armistice agreement and then we all you know hop on the peace train and let's work out something uh, that's a South Korean posi position and I think it's a very good position if it seems that currently the newly elected president of South Korea is under a lot of pressure from the US mm -hmm. um, that is affecting his popularity mm -hmm. uh, here in South yeah. Korea. Can you uh, tell us about that? Sure. Uh, Roh Moo-hyun uh, was elected uh, by and large because of more liberal segment of population, namely the youthful voters, and much more nationalistic, much more, uh, I guess, devoid of uh, Cold War mentality, progressive, uh, much more favorable perception of North Korea, even North Korea leader Kim Jong-il. Uh, those young people elected him, and uh, President Ro uh, is one who did not have a whole lot of experience in diplomacy, uh, if any, really, uh, or knowledge about uh, international affairs and so forth. And, but uh, he came, became president with a conviction that we must be self-reliant, uh, we must be uh, more nationalistic, self-assertive, and he did the first a few, uh, uh, a few months, uh, did that, uh, not even a few, few weeks, I would say. But uh, the reality was the United States pressure, the influence of the United States, especially in the economic domain, was so decisive that he could not insist on uh, doing independent or self-reliance uh, kind of foreign policy toward the United States. So what he did uh, when he visited uh, Washington for that summit meeting with uh, President Bush, he actually gave in. Uh, he asked the President Bush to uh, uh, not to consider, not to withdraw U.S. troops from South Korea. Uh, reaffirmed the strong alliance and uh, basically supported uh, the Bush administration's policy toward North Korea. 
And that made the voters back home extremely angry. And also, that may have pleased the more conservative people in South Korea. But uh, the conservative people are not going to uh, vote for him. Uh, there are different kinds of people. So he is going tremendous uh, through uh, uh, tremendous dif difficulties uh, right now. I might uh, you know, add that uh, he was wrong. He should have gone to the meeting uh, with the President Bush and should have told him that I was elected president and just like you are, my primary uh, obligation is to protect my people's lives and their property. And I'll do everything. That's what uh, I'm, I'm for. Uh, I'm mandated by that, my voters. I owe them. Uh, and uh, any kind of war uh, confrontation on the peninsula will mean that millions of people will be killed. I cannot tolerate that. And the, the the possibility of war can be uh, by in the initiation of, uh, of the United States, most likely by the initiative of North Korea, but that's unlikely. Uh, so if any language of using military or surgical strike or any kind of military exercise will uh, certainly mean uh, retaliation from North Korea, and North Korea is militarily strong enough to do something, you know, unbearable damage to my country, that is President Roe's country, and therefore I cannot go along with your military option. Uh, you have to understand, please understand, I cannot condone that, you know, and if you have to go military, I have to distance myself from you. You know, he should have that, said that, and I think would have been very persuasive argument, and he would have a lot of support even from American legislators if he did that, because that's a commonsensically so persuasive argument. Uh, I don't think he did. Uh, so you know, his uh, presidency is still very young, and I think he should uh, uh, try to uh, establish uh, a, a, an identity. Uh, uh, for his uh, foreign policy uh, uh, orientations, and I think it's still uh, too early to uh, to judge. The problem is uh, he cannot afford a trial era situation. This is not a apprenticeship. This is a real thing. He is the president. So I really hope that uh, he and his brains. Uh, the think tank people will, uh, you know, put their heads together and come up with a very rational uh, and and persuasive policy, which you may or may not, most likely, may not be consistent with uh, George W. Bush's policy toward North Korea uh, to to a large extent. But that's what uh, you know, post-war Cold War uh, uh, era calls for. Uh, Every country will become more self-reliant, more insistent on national interest, because the world is not going to be uh, ordered by domination that is hierarchical order. It will be more mutually interdependent situation. I think South Korean president must be uh, mindful of that, must be more uh, insistent on assuming initiatives in handling the Korean crisis. How do you see the current talk in the U.S. about pulling back troops away from the, uh, the border between North and South? Do you see that as a destabilizing move? And I think, I think uh, that move, the real intent, I don't know. Uh, any speculation may, uh, may be plausible, but the perception is that the Bush administration, especially this, the uh, Defense Department, Rumsfeld and, uh, and his people, uh, may be thinking military strike 
seriously, maybe removing potential targets in the form of American military personnel away from the harm's way. And that very thought, perception, is very dangerous because North Koreans, I'm certain, that are led to believe that. This is a part of their preparation to attack us. You know, North Korea is no Iraq or Afghanistan. The United States, months ago, they assembled uh, oh, more than 200,000 soldiers uh, there in Middle East, you know, surrounding Iraq. And then all kinds of bluffings and so forth, you know. That, if you did that, the North Korea will pre-preemptive strike. Uh, because, you know, if they are destroyed, they lose most of the capability to counterattack. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in this case, this is, you know, the troop movements from the front line back and perhaps uh, some partial removal uh, of ground troops from South Korea, that would be uh, interpreted by North Koreans as a part of war preparation. And I think it's a very dangerous that can trigger North Korean action uh, any time. What would be if you could deliver a message to citizens in the U.S., what would be your recommendation for what they should convey to their leaders in Congress? Uh, I think the uh, United States, the, the tragic fact is that North Korea is not known to American public. And what they know is largely distorted and wrong. Uh, I'm, I've been an American citizen for 40 years. I know America fairly well. Uh, and I, I know North Korea and South Korea very well. Uh, it, the American public has uh, uh, the right to know world affairs in this case, North Korea. And I think it's uh, basically journalists and reporters and uh, people who uh, are involved in opinion making in the United States. It's their obligation to try to go into North Korea, bring them out, and read the material, uh, and directly, indirectly, try to ascertain as a closely factual information as possible and uh, uh, tell the American people, this is North Korea. North Korean Kim Jong-il, I don't have love affair with him, but he's no Saddam Hussein. He hasn't, he hasn't mass murdered his own people. I mean, Saddam Hussein too, I don't know for a fact, but that's what uh, we have been told by U.S. establishment. Uh, but what we know, what we are told about Saddam Hussein is correct, then Kim Jong-il, I can tell you is no Saddam Hussein. You know, uh, so he's respected by his people. And uh, in North Korea, there's no uh, power conflict. There has never been. Uh, after Kim Jong-il, there will be no potential individual or groups to succeed him. So President Bush is talking about regime change once labeled North Korea as an axis of evil, as an evil country, then the only fate in biblical sense, in Christianity, the only fate for evil is death. So in fact, uh, he is, uh, Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung is very dangerous in this sense. Uh, George W. Bush is uh, not ruling out regime change at all. And I think he's more interested in regime change uprooting some evils than uh, doing something with the weapons of mass destruction. Clearly it was seen. You know, American troops didn't go in to hunt for weapons of mass destruction. If they did, they would have done it very convincingly if they, Iraq had had the weapons, but went in there to depose, to destroy Saddam Hussein regime, which it did. But in North Korean case, regime change is going to be close to impossibility. It's going to be very difficult to eliminate Kim Jong-il and even more difficult to handle the aftermath. So 
uh, the American government uh, needs to have whole new policy toward North Korea. Uh, the same uh, jacket cannot fit there. So the formula that uh, seemingly militarily successful toward uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Hey, uh, who would be surprised by the fact that the United States military militarily physically destroyed Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, it's not a big deal. The battle was won by the United States, but the war is still uh, being waged as we speak. So I like to see American policymakers and more importantly, American public to have a much bigger perspective. You know, uh, we're out of the Cold War era. era. Uh, once we define uh, some people around the world, leaders, as evils, then there will be no dialogue. You know, I'm a Christian. I've been told uh, by my mentors in that religious community, you don't deal with evils. You destroy evils. Don't touch, don't talk, you know. Uh, so I think it's very unfortunate that the U.S. Uh, you know, leader uh, defined some leaders in the world as evils and he coming from southern uh, fundamental Baptist school or schooling uh, that's a very dangerous thing and I really hope this uh, axis of evil and dismantling and regime change this syndrome will be short-lived this is just a passing like a summer uh, rain uh, you know, I don't think this can be prolonged in international domain, uh, and I hope, certainly hope not.